Well, good morning. It is good. As Pastor Evan said, I was in Tennessee with my family. It's good to be back with you. Um, you know, I have no like family ties to Tennessee uh, previously, other than that my like all in one fell swoop, my brother and his family and my parents all moved there together. And we were like, okay, I guess we're going to Tennessee now to visit family. So now instead of driving to Southern California to visit that side of the family, we fly to Tennessee. It's, it's just, you know, instead of a five-hour drive, it's a four-hour flight. Um, oh, same thing, same thing. No, I'm, I'm joking. Well, anyways, it's good to be back with you. You know, before we get into Revelation chapter 20, that's where we're going to be today. So if you've got a Bible and you want to flip open and sort of hold it there, that's where we're going to be. Um, we had a need come up with a missionary. They, they, we, we've talked to them, and many of you know uh, Tomas and Misha. These are missionaries that are a part of our church family. They were actually youth pastors here and went to go serve in the Czech Republic. They have taken on many Ukrainian refugees. Many of you know their story. Um, well, they had a minivan that they bought here, and they shipped it over to the Czech Republic, and they had new tires on here. But somehow in shipping, when they got their car back, their tires were 20 years old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and there were some other parts missing from this van. And, and so all in all, they had about $4,500 worth of repairs to do on this van that they bought here and shipped there. Now, so other churches are helping to take care of some of this expense, and we found out that they still need somewhere in the area of like $2,200, somewhere around there, uh, to kind of make ends meet. So we just, we, I talked with our missions committee, and we said, you know, let's just take a love offering. And so if you're here today and you want to help uh, these great missionaries, maybe you know them, sort of help make those unexpected uh, ends meet there, uh, then anything given to missions today. So if you have an envelope and you just want to write missions, or if you give online, you text to give, just write the word missions. Anything given today or this week, we could help direct directly to them. So we just wanted to let you know about that. So if you, uh, if any of that kind of hits your heart to, to help out uh, Tomas and Misha, anything given today to missions will go directly to them. Just wanted to let you know about that. Okay, just after today, it's just two more weeks of Revelation. Can you believe it? Are you sad? Are you happy? Are you like, Maybe I can write more chapters? No, I'm joking. Literally at the end, it says, don't add any more to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anybody for some light heresy? It's a joke. It's a joke. Well, um, the way I want to start today, like I said, if you've got your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 20. But the way I want to start today is through a little bit of a work of remembering. As a pastor, I like to play the long game, which means I've preached stuff before that will come up again and that it's really important. And so literally the week before we started the book of Revelation, one of the things that we talked about was this ultra weird text in the Bible from Genesis 6. And that this text is like just wild. It's like, wait a second, what? These, you know, the, the sons of God had children with the daughters of men and they were called the Nephilim and it just sort of ends there. And what does that all mean? And, and what we talked about that was the genesis of a spiritual battle for your allegiance. So if you remember all the way back to the January 28th sermon, or maybe you weren't here at that time, then I'll just give you the quick Twitter version. But if you remember back, we talked about that. We talked about this whole spiritual battle playing out for your allegiance. It's, it's not just in the New Testament where, where Paul says, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and, and things like that. It's not just that portion it actually starts way back, it's page one in the Bible, it starts all the way back that this spiritual battle begins to play out. It happened with Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt, right? Versus Israel. That, that the plagues against Egypt were really judgments against the gods of Egypt. And we saw that all the way through the scriptures. And, and then it goes all the way to, to Babylon. You see Daniel and he's in Babylon. And, and it's Really what God is doing is judging the gods of Babylon. And you begin to see this play out and you realize, oh, the Bible actually talks about these other gods. Now it's not uppercase G, it's lowercase g, right? These other Elohim, if you were with us in that sermon on January 28th. If not, you can go back on YouTube and watch it. A little plug for, I, I don't know. I don't know why that was funny. I, I'm, <laughs> 
All right, Exodus chapter 20. I, again, stay at Revelation chapter 20, but I want to give you a few verses. We, we tend to read verses like this and, and think of something else. So we, we read, you shall have no other gods before me, the very first command of the Ten Commandments. And we just sort of in our 21st century mind go, yes, don't make my new truck an idol. Don't, don't make my bike an idol. Don't make my new car an idol. Don't make my house an idol. Don't make my stuff an idol. We, we tend to do that. But there's actually the next command is not to have any other idols. The first command is not to have any other gods. There's a spiritual battle for your allegiance. This is my point. It's all the way in the very first chapter. God knew that he had to reform these people who were coming out of Egypt uh, coming out of that, uh, that pantheon system of Egypt where they had multiple other gods and they were allegiant to these other gods, he knew that he had to form them into his people where there was just one God, Yahweh. That's the beginning of the Ten Commandments. It's the very first commandment. And then you, you, you read this story, like I said, in Genesis chapter 6 of these other gods coming. And it's all in the Old Testament. It's all there. Again, you have to go back to an old sermon to check it out. But what is happening today in Revelation chapter 20, the genesis of this is that these gods are finally going to be dealt with. In other words, these who influence the world for evil are finally going to be dealt with. The evil forces behind the nations are finally going to be dealt with. And this isn't something that just pops up in the New Testament. Again, almost all of this stuff has its genesis in the Old. So let me just read you Isaiah 24, 21 through 23. And there's a few verses like this. Uh, Psalm 82 is this exact same way. It's just a retelling of Isaiah. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven. The king is of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. It literally in Isaiah is like, hey, one day there's these heavenly creatures. In other words, we, we, we would know them today just as evil, as forces of evil that are going to be judged. And they're what really the true power that's behind the nations. This is probably the verse that Paul was thinking of when he was talking about the powers and principalities that are, that are sort of behind evil. We don't fight against other humans. There's evil out there. It says, the Lord will punish the host of heaven, those who rebelled against God. Just as there was a human rebellion in the garden, there was a, heaven rebellion against, a heavenly rebellion against the Lord. And the kings of the earth, again, if we look back in Revelation, the kings that get their power from the beast. We looked in Revelation there uh, about this. There's this woman. And again, this is not a uh, language that I like to use or I use regularly, but it's actually in the Bible. And they call this woman the whore of Babylon. She's the one who gets her power from the beast. She's the seductress and tells everybody, come on into our nation and, and we're, we're going to give you everything you've ever wanted and ever needed, but you just have to worship the beast. You just have to worship us. That's it. That's all you got to do. And in the book of Revelation, there becomes this unholy trinity, this woman, the whore of Babylon, the beast, and the dragon. And it's sort of like done in this language that makes it difficult for us to understand. But essentially what's happening is this woman is getting her power from satanic forces. It's biblical commentary saying, you know where the kings get their power? You know where the nations get their power? They get it from the beast. And remember, we, we talked about, in again, this is all back to the January sermon, January 28th. We look back to the first Peter 3 where Jesus talks about descending or where Peter talks about Jesus descending into the pit or into Hades or into hell. And what was he doing there? He was declaring victory over the fallen angels. He was saying, you're evil and you're rebellious and you are never getting out of here. And remember what Revelation 118 says, and he says, and the living one, I die. I am the living one and I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys to death and Hades. 
So what's happening when this whole scheme of things that I'm trying to show you, even before we get into this text, is that there is a system of evil in this world. It's not just humans doing bad things, although we do that too, right? The human heart is deceptive above all things, evil above all things. Like the human heart has some brokenness to it and we do evil. But what Paul is, I mean, sorry, what John, the author of this, what Jesus is saying is that there's also spiritual forces of evil at work too. And one day, those two must come to an end. Just as the sin in your own life needs to come to an end, the evil forces, powers, and principalities need to come to an end too. And Jesus, he dies, he raises again from the dead, and he holds the keys and he says, you're never getting out of here. Evil will one day be extinguished too. So that's what's happening. And that's the, sort of the background that's the background to all of this. I might cut out for a second here. All right. So all through the book of Revelation, there's almost this rhetorical question. It's not asked directly. It's sort of this indirect, indirect rhetorical question that's asked throughout the entire thing. And that question is not, uh, not necessarily who are you, but who do you belong to? Do you belong to the Lamb who was slain, but who's really alive and sitting on the throne? Do you belong to Jesus? Are you one of his sealed and marked people? Are you marked off for his purposes? Do you belong to the lamb? Who do you belong to? Or do you belong to the beast? Are you sealed with the beast? Do you look just like the culture around you? Does your life bear no difference or resemble, or does your life bear no difference? Um, or does your life bear every resemblance to the culture around you? That, that's how you know you belong to the beast, that you look just like everybody else. If you belong to the lamb, your life should stand out a bit. So Jesus is this, kind of asking this question all throughout the book of Revelation. And in fact, that's your first fill in. The question of the entire book of Revelation asks its reader is not, what side are you on, but whom do you belong to? Whose are you? Who's got your heart? Who's got your allegiance? Who do you belong to? That's the question that the whole book asks. Is your identity is your identity tied to the lamb or to Babylon? Is your identity tied to good or to evil? Is it tied to Jesus or the beast? It asks this over and over and over again. Last week, we saw that Jesus showed up and the final battle played out. And there's probably a lot of questions that you might have over this. And I understand this is difficult parts of the Bible. There are easier parts of the Bible than the book of Revelation. I I fully get it. It is difficult. But essentially, Jesus shows up on the white horse and everything is done away with. There's no battle. There's no final battle. He just shows up and the word comes out of his mouth and he wins because he's present. And evil has to be extinguished around him. So there's always been this idea throughout the entire Bible that evil has to be dealt with. Evil has to have its time. Evil has to have this time where it's extinguished, and there'll be great joy in this time. Since long before Jesus' arrival on earth, people knew that evil would one day be dealt with, and they talked about it. It's called the Day of the Lord in the Old Testament. I mean, you could read Zechariah 14. It's there. You could read uh, Isaiah 24 we talked about. We could read Psalm 82. It's all there. Evil has to one day be extinguished. We don't always focus on that in the Old Testament. We read the New Testament stuff, but it's there. So let's get in the first 10 verses of Revelation chapter chapter 20. I'm sorry. I almost took us back 10 weeks, guys. Whew. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those who had the authority to judge, was committed. And also also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not received its mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. 
The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and false prophets were, and they were, and they were to be tormented day and night forever. We're going to pause there. Pretty light reading for this morning, right? It, it's, it's not. That's, I, I think I've said three or four times. We're reading the hardest chapter of the hardest book of the Bible, okay? This is a hard chapter. So again, I've said this multiple times throughout the series. Should we be looking for a literal dragon? Should we be looking for a literal angel holding keys in a chain? Should we identify a literal Gog and Magog that's in here? And there's been much discussion and debate about that over the years. I think one of the mistakes that people make in reading this book is they choose what's symbolic and what is literal. And the mistake that's being made here is that everything before this is symbolic and then all of a sudden we get to chapter 20 and bam, it's all literal. That's just not the way biblical interp works, biblical interpretation. And that's not the way apocalyptic literature works. It's, remember I've said before, Jesus is not a literal lamb with seven horns. That is what the text calls him because horns in that time and seven eyes and seven horns, eyes were symbolic for wisdom and horns are symbolic for power and the seven means complete. And so he's the lamb of God who has complete wisdom and complete power. To the first century church, they would have completely understood this. But to us, it just looks like these weird, you know, symbols and we don't understand it. Are there literally only 144,000 sealed? No, it's a symbol, not a statistic. Was the blood that Jesus shed really long enough to cover all of Palestine from people from head to toe, 1,600 stadia, like it says in the book of Revelation? No, I, I think it was symbolic and not a statistic. And so when we look to these numbers and when we come to the numbers that are in here, a thousand years, one of the things we have to ask is, is it a literal thousand years or is it a symbol rather than a statistic? I know, it gets tough, especially if you're entrenched in a certain end time system. I, I get it. It gets a little bit tough. So one of the things that we've learned through this series is that numbers are symbols and not statistics. I'd be glad to be wrong about that, by the way. I mean, I, I, I just want to come out here and tell you that I have read probably now... 16 or 17 full commentaries on the book of Revelation through my time as a pastor. And all of them fight with each other. They do. They battle with each other. They're like, well, this word, and they do battle over it all. And I, and I get it. So what I'm telling you is I'm going with what I think is the best, uh, that honors all of scripture the best. Because the method I like to use in biblical interp is how does the Bible interpret the Bible? Use the Bible to find meaning. Don't go outside the Bible yet. First, go to the Bible, find meaning. Where does it connect with the Old Testament? And then ask the theologians. Scripture's always first. So that's the method I like to use. So when, when, um, when, as I dig through it, this is the best possible translation that I can bring to you and give to you. But I'm telling you, there's people that disagree with this. So feel free to disagree, and if you could prove me wrong, I'd be, I'd be glad to listen. That's fine. I'm not trying to, like, win an argument here. All I'm telling you is I think this is the most faithful way to translate this text. So instead of showing you all these theological points today, um, I basically would rather say this. I, along with a lot of other theologians, believe that the theological point of the millennium or the thousand years is solely to demonstrate the triumph of the Lamb and of the faithful with Him. The martyrs 
those who were put to death in the hands of Rome, but really live, those who are faithful to Jesus. I, th I think that's the main theological point of the millennium, because we could get bogged down in that thousand years, and we could talk about it for hours, but I want to do that. I just want to go to the big theological point. This is a consistent message. Um, four of the seven churches had promises in Revelation that would end right here. Let me start reading in verse 4 again. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those who had, whom had the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark of their forehead or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. See, the idea of following Jesus is Jesus is training you to reign with him in heaven. Not that you get the power that he's got. The point is that you have a purpose in heaven, some sort of eternal purpose. I don't know exactly what that is, but one, one of the things that Paul says is, don't you understand how important you are? One day you're going to be judging angels. If you were with us in our first Corinthians series, we looked at that text and it was like, it looked like it came out of left field, but essentially what he was saying is, you're going to be judging all these evil fallen angels who rebelled against God. You're going to be judging with God. That's what Revelation chapter 20 says, that these believers are set up on thrones with God. The ones who were faithful to the end reigned with Christ and get to sit on the throne with God. They're actually in charge of judging those who fell from heaven, these evil powers. So let's just recall for a second. We know the first few chapters of the book of Revelation are actually a letter to churches. In fact, this whole thing is a letter to these churches. And all the way back in chapter 2, the promise to these churches ended here in chapter 20. Revelation 2, 2.11, the church in Smyrna, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. It talks about that in here. The church in Thyatira, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. The church in Sardis, Revelation 3, 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit on the throne with me on my throne, as I also have conquered and sat down uh, with my father on his throne. So my point about biblical interpretation going back to the text to find meaning this is where I'm, where I'm getting at. Revelation, if you just read Revelation chapter 20, divorced from Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you might think that this thousand years is, could mean a thousand different things. But what I really think that, that John and Jesus are trying to get across here is it's about the victory of God's people. Those who are faithful witnesses, those who have lived in Babylon and in that culture of evil and have stood up with Jesus in the midst of that, the faithful. It's about that. It's about those people who are faithful to Jesus in the midst of all of this. It's the point he was trying to make in chapters two and three. And it's not just those who are martyred, it's those who have their citizenship in heaven. They get to rule with Jesus. The, ruler of the, the rulers of the kingdom of earth um, is gone, and now my people get to oversee it. That's the whole idea. The, all of evil is now gone, and now God's people get to oversee the governance of earth. And, and I know that it seems wild because a lot, this is like deep, deep stuff in the Bible, and we don't always get to this deep, deep stuff all the time. Sometimes we just get to, Jesus died for me, he loved me, and he wants me to live life with him and transform me. Some, and that's good too, but this is just some really deep stuff when you get into, the, into the, the, the bowels of Revelation chapter 20. The idea here is that the ruler of the kingdom of the earth, Satan, will go away and be replaced with God's people. Now, Jesus is always on the throne. That's why we sang that song this morning. Jesus is still on the throne. And, and I think you could look at the craziness of today. Like, we, I don't want to miss how unique the last month has been in our world, right? 
It has just been completely wild. It's like there was an assassination attempt on a former president. There's a, a sitting president who said they're not going to run again. There's a, a, a new presidential candidate on that side. And, and, and not only that, like that's huge news just in America, but then you've got Israel and you've got, you've got um, uh, Iran and, and you've got developments in Ukraine and, and Russia. And it's like, what is happening in this world, Right? It, you could kind of look at our world, the craziness of our election cycle, and, and you could look at what's happening in Israel and Iran. You could look at Ukraine and Russia. And you could look at what China might do, and you could literally build the anxiety up for yourself and say, this world's falling apart. What's going to happen? Ah, I don't know what's going on. But what Revelation 20 tells us in the midst of this crazy world is that those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus will one day, at the culmination of all things, be God's partners in overseeing the new creation. They'll be God's partners in overseeing the elimination of all evil. The evil will literally have no place left. See, I think the entire point of the millennium is missed when we go too deeply into pro, pre-millennial, post-millennial, and all the, different, all, millennial, all the different millennial stuff. They have their place. They're worth knowing. They're worth studying. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I, but when we go too deeply into it, into a sermon, I think we, we miss it because the plain reading of the text here is to show us that this was a promise to the church, that you get to reign and rule with God in heaven. So after Jesus talks about the millennium, he uses an equally troubling phase. He talks about the battle between Gog and Magog. Like I said, maybe you're new to church and you've never even heard these terms before. I'll tell you what, I, was, I, I think I was like a pastor for a couple years and somebody said to me, what do you think Gog and Magog is in the battle and in the Bible? And I said, yeah, you know, I've done some things. Let me get back to you. I, I just, I, I'll be honest, I lied. I had not even heard about that. I was like, I was a youth pastor, actually. I, I was like, yeah, let me, let, me, let me do some research and get back to you on that. No clue. Because it only shows up in two places of the Bible, and yet people have entire books written about this. And the two places are in Ezekiel uh, 38 and 39 and in Revelation chapter 20. And people have tried uh, to really, really, really zone in on, like, what nations are these? Because what Jesus is saying in Revelation chapter 20, what, what John is saying actually as he's writing this is, is that the, the battle is going to culminate between Gog and Magog, blah, blah, blah. But what he's really doing is he's quoting Ezekiel 38 and 39. Um, I, I just want to read to you from a theologian about this. At other times, historical identification of Gog has been attempted by playing with the Hebrew words and creating false linguistic connections with the names of historical figures. In this regard, Lust, another theologian, observes that the Septuagint renders the phrase um, rosh as, uh, he gets into a bunch of Hebrew here, sorry, and modern readers can easily make the mistake of pointing the, pointing the finger at Russia because he uses the word rosh, which is a misinterpretation of the Septuagint, which is a Greek version of the Hebrew version. Again, it gets really deep and all this stuff, but what I'm saying is you could go down these roads of going, oh man, Gog and Magog, that must mean something. And oh, it's Russia. Oh, it's China. Oh, it's, it, I don't know what country it is. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. For centuries, I've heard people, I mean, people have said, oh, it's Russia. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. Russia wasn't even a, a figment of the imagination of the biblical writers, by the way, at the time. Let me give you a reason why um, it is this way, like why people think this way. We're not the only ones reading the Bible, right? <laughs> um, God doesn't give us specifics. We don't know who Gog and Magog are, and I would, I would venture to tell you that any theologian I've ever read has no clue who these are. But what it really just kind of means is the four corners of the earth that nations will come from all over. And you've seen this happen over and over and over again. And, and let me tell you, I think the reason why God, did, God does not make it plain, but people just use this language, Gog and Magog, is this. Um, there's some end time stuff we just don't know in the Bible. And we just have to admit we don't know, that we don't have the full, we don't have the full understanding of that. In fact, Jesus says, only the Father in heaven knows. Why is this? 
Well, I don't think we're the only ones reading the Bible. I think that there's evil forces in this world that know God's playbook, and they've been reading it. So imagine if they had it all laid out for them. Do you know what I mean? If they had God's uh, playbook all laid out for them, and they knew exactly what was going to happen, then they could undermine it or usurp it or whatever. But there's just some things we don't know, and that's okay. That's okay. If you remember, uh, if you remember the Syrian civil war, I was actually in Israel during the Sur- Syrian civil war. Uh, Russia, of course, is an arms dealer and ally with Syria. I had a pastor friend of mine tell me, oh, Gog and Magog are 40 miles away outside of Israel. Do the math. The end times are imminent. It's going to happen like right now. And, and then, you know, they, they pulled out. His calculations were off. It's, it's fun to have theories. It's fun to have theories. But there's an inherent danger in speculative theology. And the danger is that we're merely guessing rather than searching for the truth in God's word. And so I want to caution us against guessing. And I'm sorry if you're new, you're like, man, who is this guy? (laughs) Um, So what I think Gog and Magog are about are about the nations of the four corners of the earth. It's a way of saying all the nations are going to descend onto Israel. I think it's just a way of saying that. So what I think John is doing here is saying, when Satan gets out of his thousand-year prison, um, he, he will gather the last remnants of his army and come again, and come against Jesus again. I think that's what's happening because it says there's going to be a thousand-year period. So there's a time, a long period of time, um, where evil is extinguished, and then evil gets to get out of the prison again. And the idea is that. G- Jesus needs to root out all bits of evil and completely demolish it. So which brings us to our next, next strange thing here in Revelation chapter 20. There's a strange catch and release of Satan that I just talked about. The nations gather against Jesus and his people. And what is all of this about, right? It may seem strange to us, but that's all part of God's divine plan to make sure that every trace of evil is rooted out allowing for this great transformation into a new heaven and a new earth, which the next couple of weeks we're going to talk about. It's, it's an amazing bit of scripture the next couple of weeks. I'll tell you this, the next two weeks get entirely less confusing. <laughs> that helps you. In this text, it says that Gog and Magog come out and surround the city of God, uh, the surround the city which God loves, which is his people, and then he destroys them with fire. And finally, Satan is gone and all evil with it. This catch and release plan was God's way of rooting out the last bits of evil on the earth. And I think that's what this is talking about. And we're only in verse 11. I hope you guys brought a sack lunch. Okay, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. I, I'm kidding. I'm not going to go through your lunch. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, stand before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in these books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead and those who were in it. Death and Hades gave up their dead and those who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. God bless you. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This text makes two points that I want to spend the rest of our time on. First, verse 12. And then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in these books according to what they had done. So figuratively, of course, there's a bunch of books in heaven, right? And I think what John is trying to say is, is what is in your book? What is in your photo album? This is where the sermon gets a lot easier, and you could follow along a lot easier because we don't have to do, dive so much deeper into crazy, weird stuff and theology and thousand years and all that stuff. What's in your book? What is your life written? If you, you know, how many of you like go back and, and, and look through photos on your photo reel, right? My, my, my daughter doesn't have social media on her phone. She has a phone, no social media. And so sometimes to spend, spend the time, she's just scrolling back through old photos. Dad, you remember this? Dad, you remember this? Dad, you remember this? What does your photo album show? 
I, I like when I'm like back with my parents and, and my brother and all that stuff, we like talk about old times and old pictures and things like that. What does your photo album show? What does your life reveal? Because there's two books. There's two books. And everybody's going to get judged. It's not just evil that gets judged here too. You get judged too. Judgment's coming for all of us. It's not just uh, these evil, you know, those who rebelled against God in heaven. It it is about all of us. So what is in your photo album? What is going to be played before the king of kings on his throne? The book that shown, there's a book that shows all the deeds that you have done in your entire life. And of course, figuratively. And there's a book that shows what Jesus has done with his life. Which one would you rather be judged by? See, on on the day of our final judgment, God will look at our deeds. And and there, there used to be this question, right? Are you saved by faith or saved by works? And the answer is yes, because no reasonable person thinks that um, the Bible teaches that you can separate your belief and your behavior. Your belief and behavior are all one of the same thing. Your behavior simply reveals what you believe. Did you know that? Sometimes it's weird. In 21st century America, we, we think that we could like, oh, I, I believe this, so I'm good, but then you could act a completely different way. Like, no, 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 no. No, nobody in the Bible would have understood that at all because our actions reveal what is at the heart of our beliefs. You can't just say, well, I believe this, but then act completely differently. You can't do that. See, we're judged by our deeds because it's actually the most reliable indicator of what we believe. Do you get that? Your actions, what you do with your life, the way you raise your kids, the way you respond in stressful circumstances, the the way that you are in this world reflects what you deeply believe and what's rooted into you. It's like when Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our words reveal the true nature of our heart. In the same way, our deeds reveal the true nature of our belief. So let's just consider the following scenario. I'm going to tell you a story about me, and I like to tell self-effacing stories so you know I'm not just a a Bible teacher, but that I'm also kind of a moron. Um, (laughs) Just like anybody else. Last year, I was jumping on a trampoline with my kids at a trampoline park. We have four broken bones, I think, or three or four broken bones at trampoline parks. And uh, I added to that, I kicked a wall on accident, broke my big toe. Yeah, oh, it was bad. I, I, I actually looked back because I was like, was that a year ago or was that two years ago? I can't remember. I looked back. March 5th last year, broke my big left big toe in a bad way. It's black and blue. It was nasty. And we happened to have like a really good doctor in our congregation. And uh, I asked him to take a look at it. And many of you also know I love to ride bikes. And I, I like to go in the group rides and the race rides and all that stuff. I'm, I'm no... Uh, I'm no Evan Huffman, if you know his story, but, but I do love to ride bikes, and I, and I do it every day, and I'm disciplined about it and all this stuff. And this doctor looks at my toe, and he says, you know, I, here's what I think. I think you need to go get an x-ray so we know for sure, but I'm pretty sure this is what it is. And he told me what it is, where it's broken and all that. And you need at least a month of light duty. Like if you go on your bike, you know, maybe don't wear those shoes, and maybe just pedal softly and and, you know, but you really don't want to push this because it could heal wrong and you could have problems for years and, and, and go, go do that. And I just said, I, I know you're right, but I just feel like you're wrong. <laughs> and so instead of going to get an x-ray, I rode my bike light for a week. And then it was race season was starting. The, the South River ride was starting. And so I jumped in with like as hard as I could go. And every day after I rode my bike, my toe was throbbing. I had to put ice on it and lift it up. And instead of taking a few months to heal, it probably just healed a couple of weeks ago. Do you think this doctor, whom I love and respect, by the way, has the sufficient grounds to say, Pastor Dave, do you trust me? I think he does, which I do. I do trust him. 
but my own uh, moronic ideas won. But he's like, I- I've given you this great diagnosis. I'm able to help you. I could help heal that toe if you just trust me. Do you trust me? Or do you sort of trust me? And my point is, our trust is revealed, who we trust is revealed by our actions. I say, I I said I trusted him, but then I went and did what I wanted to do. And I paid the penalty. I paid the price. Sometimes we say we trust Jesus, but then we live and go do something else. And we pay the price. I think Jesus has a reasonable question for you today. Do you trust me or do you sort of trust me? See, this is your next fill in. Our actions reveal our true allegiance and our true allegiance reveals who we put our trust in. Our actions reveal our true allegiance and our true allegiance reveals who we put our trust in. Belief and behavior cannot be divorced. It's why Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? That question alone should be convicting for most of us here today, right? Why do we come here and worship Jesus and then we don't do at all what he calls us to do? So on that great day that you stand before God, he will say, hey, you trusted me, and it showed up everywhere I'm reading in this book. I hope that's what he says. Some of us are like, man, I, I don't want to give an accounting of my life. I can't show Jesus the, the book of my life. I can't show him the photo album. I don't want him to see it. But praise God, there's two books. There's the book that your actions in your life have or the book of Jesus's actions. What book do you want to be tested by? What book do you want to be judged by? All of us, when we die, will have to give an accounting of our life And on that day, we've got two options. The first option is to tell our tale, to stand, you know, to say, hey, this is what I've done. I think I'm worth it, God. I think I deserve this, right? The second is to take our stand, not based on what we've done, but based on what Jesus has done on the cross. The last feeling is this. I think it's the last feeling. I don't know. This is a long sermon. There are two books that I can be judged by, the book of my life or the book of Jesus's life. Whose works do I want to be judged by? For me, I find no hope in option one. I find no hope in my book. So when you stand before God, whose book do you want to read? When you stand before God, do you want to say, well, it started in 19, blah, 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 and this is what I did? Or do you want to say, yeah, I got my book, but I, I actually trust in this book. Jesus, you died on the cross for me. And you, you ransomed my life from my own sin. You saved me. One day, death will be completely extinguished. And it has to be extinguished in order to get to the new creation. The Apostle Paul tells us the beginning, this has already happened. He says this, For as, as, um, as by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam die, so too in Christ all should be made alive. Jesus overcame death. And if you put your trust in him, you will too. And one day, this is your last feeling, I think. Death itself will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what this text says. So when you read this text and you, you, you go, man, it, it seems scary. You don't know what's going to happen, all this stuff. There's actually incredible hope. You don't have to be judged by your own book. You, you, you don't have to be judged by that. You can be judged by Jesus' book. Death will one day be extinguished. It will be gone. It has no place in the new creation. In, in order for the new to come, the old stuff has got to go. So I've got a couple of questions for you, and this is how I'm going to end. I want to invite Jeff and the band back up, and I want to end this way. Do you trust Jesus? If Jesus were standing right here, I think he's got sufficient grounds to say, I I died for you. I bled for you. I, I was dead for three days. I went to the grave. I proclaimed victory over the captives. I raised again to life, appeared to over 500 people. And, and you know, then the Holy Spirit came on the church and there's an incredible worldwide movement. Do you trust me? 
I think he's got sufficient grounds to ask that question. Do you trust me? Does your life reveal that you trust him? Do the actions of your life reveal that you've put your faith in Jesus? Do you trust me? Does it show up everywhere? So that's the first question. And the second is this. And I think God would probably say, I, you know, I raised my son so that death wouldn't have the final say anymore. Are you living with this eternal perspective that one day you're going to live forever? And an eternal perspective looks like you, you look at your friends, you look at your family, you, you look at everybody around you, and you look at it with eternity in view and say, one day these two people are, two are going to face this exact same question. What book do you want to be judged by? Have you revealed to them what Jesus has done for you? Maybe you're here today and you need to place your trust and your hope in Jesus. I want to invite you to do that right now. You could do that with a prayer. You could say, Jesus, I, I trust you. Help me to overcome this unbelief. God, help me to be judged by the book that you've written, not by my deeds and my actions, because those fall short. Maybe you're here today and that needs to be your prayer. Or maybe you're here today and you simply need to start praying for somebody else because you have an eternal perspective on their life that they don't have. I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, pray that people would put their hope and trust in you today. God, as one day you will remove all death and you will extinguish evil from among us and the new creation will come. God, we await that day. Even the things that are happening in our own world right now that just seem so wild and crazy, we could have security because we know that you are on the throne. So God, help us to live with this eternal perspective in view. To put our trust in you and to live that out every day of our lives. Lord, we give ourselves to you. We just pray that you would be with us as we come to worship you now. Help those who are making a decision right now to follow you. God, to really place their hope and trust in you. Jesus, we believe what you've done on the cross. In the name of Jesus.